All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Keith Sherburn. I'm a member of the AMS Board for Operational and Government Meteorologists. And today we're gonna to be hosting a couple of meteorologists from WFO Huntsville, who are gonna be talking about their partnership with University of Alabama at Huntsville. So I'm gonna turn it over to Katie McGee and Brian Carcione. All right. Hi, my name is Katie. I am a meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Huntsville, and I've been here for about three years. I went to NC State for undergrad, UNC Charlotte for grad school, and while I was at NC State, I partook in their volunteer program, and having that experience really helped solidify my desire to work for the Weather Service, and so when I saw what the university at Huntsville had with the office here. It was a big draw for me. So I'm so happy to be here. So happy to be able to be involved in what we're doing today and really excited to share this with you all. And hi, everyone. My name is Brian Carcioni. I'm the science and operations officer uh, here at the Huntsville office. Um, so my, my experience with the Huntsville office goes back almost 20 years. Um, I got my degree, uh, my undergraduate degree at Penn State. Um, so I got to see what um, a collaboration uh, could could contribute uh, at the at the state college and Penn State uh, co-located offices, um, and then came here after that. And UAH is such a fundamental part of what we do, and that's really kind of helped inform this partnership. Um, so I'm excited to talk about that. All right, so. Um, like I said, so like I said, I've been I've been here for for almost since the very beginning, um, and if you go back to 2002, um, the office actually was operational in 2003. So we had um, staff who arrived before the office went operational, and from the very beginning, um, our forecasters, our managers, even our uh, information technology officer. Uh, began teaching and guest lecturing courses from the very beginning. So um, early, early on, when UAH allowed the office to be constructed in one of their facilities, it was realized that this should not be just any other um, standalone, off in the distance weather offices. Um, there was a partnership that began from the very beginning, and we've been a part of uh, UAH uh, curriculum in, in, in a variety of different ways. So if we fast forward to 2012, um, we had been participating in programming courses, mesoscale courses, things like that. Um, but it took the arrival of Christina Crow, who is uh, one of our forecasters at the time and a UAH alumna, and um, Ryan Wade, who came to UAH with um, some private sector operational experience. Um, they, had been, they had worked together during their time at UAH and they got together and said, let's do something that's a little more um, operationally oriented. We have some things that kind of dance around the subject, um, but this let's do something that gets right to the core of the matter. Um, and that initiated um, a course that we'll, we'll call um, operational weather forecasting, or sometimes you'll see us uh, refer to it as OWF. Um, in some of the some of the subsequent slides here, um, and if you can go to the next slide, um, so then in 2014, Christina moved on to uh, National Weather Service headquarters, and so I took over. Um, and 2014 was challenging for a lot of different reasons because we had um, challenges with staffing um, as. As fast as as dedicated as I was to the course, as dedicated as the the office was to the course, um, sometimes it's tough to keep office involvement if you're just doing your best to keep the lights on. Um, so in 2014, um, I was helping coordinate some involvement, but we weren't really uh, doing quite as much as we had been in prior years. Um, but even as by 2017, we were looking around and saying okay, the staffing's gotten better, but there's so much more we could be doing. And there's stuff that we're having to strip out of the course because there's only so much time in a semester. So um, we started saying, well, what, what would we do if we had a whole second semester? 
Um, so we started talking about a second course. And then in 2021, um, Katie actually saw that to fruition. We actually had our first ever uh, semester of advanced forecasting for decision support uh, back in the spring. Um, and that was, you know, as you can see here, that was that was many years in the making. Um, and then this fall here in fall 2021, um, we had uh, the first ever uh, student, former student, actually helping to teach the operations course uh, for the first time. So next slide, please. So our overall goals in this is point back to this constant question that we ask ourselves, which is, what do I wish I was told in school to do my job? Um, I'm sure we all think about this in the um, heat of operations. I wish I'd known about this when, when I signed up to do this job. And so our, that's kind of the overarching goal. What, what should we be covering and what, what do we wish we had known? Um, so that's, that's a really foundational point. Um, also important, we're producing our future coworkers and bosses. We want them, it's about what do we wish they knew coming into this uh, that's, that's just as important um, to, our, to our overall planning. Um, and then last but not least, um, it's really impressive when we do these um, exercises and simulations we may have a specific outcome in mind, but the students often go far and above what we expect. They are far more creative, far more adaptable than we expect. And um, so it's really good to learn from that when we're planning this out because each class has been better than the last one. So uh, we've been raising the bar with each subsequent semester. Next slide, please. So teaching these courses is a little bit um, of administrative uh, gymnastics here. Um, most of our courses, or for most of our uh, forecasters, um, when they guest lecture for the class, they're doing it on work time, um, either while they're on shift, um, very infrequently for comp time or overtime. Um, it's part of their duties. As I mentioned earlier, um, UAH is kind of an integral part of our um, operational identity. And so this is, um, this is part of our operational stance is that this is something we should be doing to help foster our university weather service uh, partnership. Um, on very, very rare occasions, um, folks have had to do guest lectures on personal time. That's not preferred. Um, on, and I say, for example, one time I guess this was 2018 when uh, the, the, the first President Bush uh, passed away. Um, they had his funeral and it was declared a national holiday, um, but that was the same day of, uh, of the final exam. So I did that on my personal time, but that's, we'd prefer not to do it that way. Um, and then the last consideration is that if you are going to be the lead instructor, um, You've got a choice of doing it all on work time, but that's that becomes a big challenge because that's a lot of responsibility to do it on work time. Um, probably the better approach is to get paid for it, but then you have to do it on your personal time as a university employee. Um, so that kind of adds a little bit of a challenge in terms of scheduling and in terms of flexibility, but it means you're getting paid for what you're doing. Next slide, please. Now, when we say operational, um, for the for the title of these classes, we're looking at this through a weather forecast, a local WFO perspective. Um, so that includes um, providing decision support services, um, creating forecast discussions and forecasts and things like that. Um, even even something as mundane as answering phones, um, as well as the forecasting process in general. Um, there are obviously weather service operational considerations uh, when you get to center weather service units or river forecast centers, but um, this is kind of uh, what everyone knows, and it's certainly our area of expertise. And it's also been important to me to make sure that what we cover in an NWS-centric course can also apply to the, to the private sector. We've had a number of students go on to the private sector and um, you know, providing decision support services and answering phones are things that 
you'll have to do in, in any job that's operationally oriented. So um, that, that's also been an important part of all of this. Next slide, please. So when all this got started in 2012, um, we were kind of focused on high impact weather operations, uh, weather service partners, um, and really providing very unique opportunities that you definitely weren't going to get in any other class. Um, so radar interrogation, severe weather, we had a, an exercise on um, uh, surveying storm damage. Uh, we had exercises on um, writing uh, terminal aerodrome forecasts or TAFs. Um, so it was um, mostly focused on high impact weather operations, but um, that was kind of the starting point. By 2014, when we started to shift a little bit, um, we had, you can see our, our, the operational weather field experience had, had shifted a little bit because of uh, the change in um, weather service perspective and all of this. Um, we, had, we had classes on, for example, the graphical forecast editor, GFE. And that's the picture at top right is uh, we have a forecaster, senior forecaster, Dan Dixon, and uh, our app applications integration meteorologist, uh, Chris White, talking about GFE and the forecasting process. Um, we even had things like a weather event simulator case um, for, for the radar warning process. And that's the picture at bottom right. Um, so we were still doing some unique things at this point, but our focus had shifted a little bit away from the original intent and what are some of the ways that the weather service can help contribute to uh, to this course in different ways next slide please but at this point we looked at things and said let's go back to this idea of what do i wish i knew in school to do my job and by 2016 the job has changed the job had changed um, and i remember telling uh, Ryan Wade, our, our UAH contact, look, learning to beat Moss is not as much our focus anymore. GFE is not as much our focus anymore. It's more about uh, providing weather information to decision makers. And so that shifted our priorities. Um, we had learned some lessons about how to better organize our operational involvement. And so that shifted our focus more to decision support services. Um, we also saw the course as opportunity to fill some educational gaps from other UAH courses. For example, um, there's no tropical class at UAH, so we uh, have basically turned over a couple of weeks to uh, tropical operations. Next slide, please. So this is the 2016 uh, agenda or uh, syllabus, and you can see at this point we've, we've turned over a couple of weeks to a tropical cyclone forecasting. Um, some of the things are the same, but we've shifted uh, the focus a little bit more to kind of basic forecasting approaches. Um, the weather event simulator is still in there, but uh, its focus has shifted. And perhaps most importantly, the last couple of weeks are focused on map discussions and forecasting assignments and forecasting exercises. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. Next slide, please. So this was the point where we said, you know, we, we really need to be doing this more in a, an active learning environment. It, we need to stop talking about this like it's an abstract and put students in the situations we're asking them to learn about. So we started doing more exercises and, and putting students in these situations. And 2016 was the first year we started doing a final exam exercise. Uh, Ryan and I had an aha moment when we looked at each other and said, why are we doing the final exam like it's any other class? Um, so that, that gets us to the picture you see on your screen, which is uh, the mock operations final exam from, I believe it's 2018. Um, and that, so what we do here, um, it's a two and a half hour final exam period. And we start five to seven days in advance looking for areas across the United States that have active weather. And we want it to be active weather. We don't want this to be easy. 
And by three days out, we've usually honed in on a, on a specific weather service uh, county warning area. Um, we're looking for areas with active weather, but also areas where we can um, find interesting injects or interesting, um, yeah, injects is the best term I can use. So, our, you know, is if we're going to if we're going to the Pacific Northwest, well, we know that Portland has a soccer team, and we know that Portland has, um, you know. Mount Hood and hiking and things like that. So those are some things that we can add that will um, add some unexpected twists to the to the exercise. Um, so we we hone in that hone in on an area about three days in advance, and then at that point we begin telling the students, okay, you're going to be focused on this area. Start looking at the weather. We don't want them to come in completely cold. Uh, but start looking at the weather, start looking at what might be a concern, and they start familiarizing themselves with the weather, with the geography, um, all of those kinds of things, so that they don't come in cold, but they come in with some measure of uh, awareness of what's going on, what they might have to deal with. Next slide, please. So this, this did add the challenge of, do we want to do real-time events or archived events? Um, there, you know, it's kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, on one hand, there's no need to download data. The students can go to whatever their favorite forecasting website is and can look at any data they want, but it means that you're, gambl you're gambling on an active forecast. And there have been times when uh, the weather has been a little less interesting than we thought it would be, but that's, that's been fine. There's been more than enough for them to deal with. Um, on the flip side, if we do something that's archived, it can be tough sometimes to give them all the data they need in an archived case to accomplish the tasks we're acting, acting or asking of them. So for example, if we are asking them to provide uh, an aviation forecast for a stranded hiker or something like that, well, if we don't have all the various things that you might do for an aviation forecast, then that's, that's putting them at a, at a distinct disadvantage. So I think we found that real time has been more beneficial, but um, that's still been kind of a, a, that's something we've evaluated on a year by year basis. So for the rest, I will turn it over to Katie. Oh, I'm sorry, this is still my slide, is it still my it? mistake. No, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, I'll just, I'll just sit here. Go ahead. Okay, so the, I'm going to slide ahead of myself. So um, when we started these mock operations exams, we found the first time we did it, the students were completely unprepared for it. And that was a, that was a significant drawback. The students were, their eyes got about this big around, like, what have, what, what have I gotten myself into? Um, I think it was very informative for them, but they, they were completely unprepared for it. So in in subsequent years, we've done a gradual ramp up in the course. So we've um, given them a, a few weeks to start building up their skill set, where we take bits and pieces from the entire semester and start putting them all together, which they hadn't done before. So for example, the first week, we might have them do some sort of a known decision support service, uh, inject, write a forecast discussion, and produce some sort of a forecast. And then the next week for the second uh, mock operations uh, class, we'll do all of those things, but we'll start, we'll add just a little bit to it. Maybe we add a social media graphic. Maybe we add um, an unknown DSS event. So we're taking what we did before and just adding just a little bit more to it. And so for the final exam, again, we're building on that even further. There may be two known DSS events. There may be two DSS injects. So this way they're not completely caught off guard the way that first course, that first, that first class was, sorry. Um, and the, this way we build up those skill sets um, and build up their confidence as well. Now I turn it over to Katie. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, you're fine. So an important theme throughout this whole course has been recursively analyzing and improving everything. And Ryan and Brian have carried 
the torch so much. So a big thing was, you know, what if they're on leave? What if they're out? So planning these mock operations has been very much an effort between the two of them. So trying to incorporate more of the office into this, trying to build these skills, because these are skills that pay off later in your career, being able to build these exercises, deliver injects, understand the multifaceted operations that happen at a WFO. So what we did was develop an exercise planning document that really isn't based on anything specific other than experience, what has worked the best. So we'll walk you through that. And then also an example that we used last fall. So UAH students, if you're watching this, look away because this is the secret sauce to everything we do. Um, well, okay. So this is an example of how we guide everything through the first mock operation. So we have a couple guiding principles we look for when planning these types of events. First and foremost, you want to set your goals for the exercise. Really focus on what are your priorities? What do you want the student to learn? Oh my goodness, this is going so slowly. Okay, here we go. So then once you set your goals, once you establish what you want the student to learn, you then decide how rigorous do you want it to be? How many of these goals do you want to test at one time? Especially if it's the first mock operations, like Brian said, you don't want to completely overwhelm them. You'll know, build on what the course has done so far. And then also recognize that handling more goals, having that added complexity and moving parts means that you're probably going to need to have a little bit more team support. So making sure that you recognize that and you staff appropriately. Um, and then last, or not lastly, we're nowhere near the end. Um, how long should the exercise take? You know, you got a plan. We fit these within the course time, which is one hour and 20 minutes. So making sure you keep that in mind, because if you're just overwhelming them and overwhelming them and overwhelming them, you know, the most experienced forecasters wouldn't be able to keep up. And keeping in mind, these are students. This is a learning environment. We want this to be a safe place where they're comfortable asking questions and coming to us as well. So making sure that, you know, it, it's a very delicate balance to try and maintain. And then keeping in mind, what will be the final deliverables, making sure that they tie into your goals. So again, we'll go through an example later, but keeping in mind, what is it you want the students to produce? And then will there be any injects? We've thrown that term around a little bit. Those are just surprises to throw people off. It could be a phone call you weren't expecting. It could be like Brian said, an aviation forecast for a lost hiker. That's not something you plan ahead of time if you are living that simulation. And so that, again, is something that could be connected to the goals. If you're trying to evaluate their briefing skills, that's an opportunity for you to have someone give you a briefing, stand up right then, right there, tell me what your forecast is while they're still analyzing things, because that happens all the time in operations. So once you are done evaluating your injects, you then have to decide how will you deliver the initial information? Like Brian said, we try and give them as much of a heads up as possible to set them up for success as much as we can. And then once you decide how you're going to deliver the initial information, you decide how will you deliver the injects? What methods will you use there? And then in what format do you expect the final deliverables? We try and add a little bit of flexibility there so that we, the students can exhibit their creativity, but sometimes they appreciate having a little bit more guidance for those. So, you know, we say you're more than welcome to do this format, but go crazy if you have another idea. So now a timeline for a real time weather event, which like Brian said is so much easier and we really try and lean on real time weather events as much as possible. So a week out, we really try and gain a sense of the synoptic patterns, active areas, and then we construct a rough exercise outline based on those guiding principles. So one week out, we'll go through and answer all of these questions. And so then three days out, we start, you know, it's very much like your forecast funnel that you go through. So one day out, very broad, very generic, just what are our goals? What are the deliverables? So then three days out, we really hone in a little bit more, focus a little bit more on the specific locations or regions, notify your participants of that potential region. So again, they can start getting a feel for how things are going and then really orchestrate who's going to be responsible for which parts on our end as moderators or actors. So a moderator is the person who is a part of the student's group and is there to 
deliver the injects sometimes or is there to help answer questions. It's a constant resource for them. And then actors, that's kind of the fun role. Moderators, you know, you're always there. You're always on actors. You can call and you deliver the inject. So if you are someone who is fantastic at accents, if you are someone who is just very creative, if you're someone who can talk a mile a minute and draw out these conversations, my friend, you are an actor for this simulation. So this is really where people let their creative juices flow. It can be a lot of fun. And then you also want to make sure you develop a complimentary guide for moderators. So you have the general outline for students, but then you also need a general outline for moderators. What time are we calling which group? How are we going to call them? What inject are we delivering when? So you want to make sure that there is this constant structure for that as well. And then the day of, that's when you check in with all of the moderators and actors, make sure we are all on the same page. Everyone has seen the guide. We are good to go answer any final questions for the participants. That's usually like minutes beforehand. And then make sure everyone has access to the appropriate materials. Sometimes things fall through the cracks, especially as a weather service employee. Um, sometimes when you upload things, it can be NOAA only can view it. So you need to make sure that all of the students are able to open everything and then also develop answer guides. If you are really trying to prioritize offering feedback, that is a big thing as well. So now just walking through a sample exercise document here, it will probably take just as long to load. Um, so if I had been smart, I would have loaded this sooner, but alas, here we are. Okay, so goals for the exercise. Again, this was the first mock ops. We just wanted to make them develop an AFD, get used to writing that for an area experiencing some type of impactful weather, and then practice answering questions from partners in the public via phone. We'll touch on this a little bit more, but this was our super fun fall 2020 semester where everything was virtual. So phones were actually just a breakout group on Google Meet, or we actually tried doing a separate Google Meet. There were lots of lessons learned. We'll get there. I'm ahead of myself here. So then how rigorous do we want it to be? We figured out moderate rigor. It's the end of the semester. We peppered in mini exercises throughout the semester, so we can kind of turn up the heat a little bit. And then one thing I didn't touch on in this first paragraph that you may have already read is that yes, this is their first mock operations, but they have been doing these exercises throughout the semester. So sometimes for those exercises, your moderators can kind of guide them and say, all right, you know, who's doing what? How are we delegating everything? Not here. The students are on their own. The moderator is there if they have specific questions about specific facets. It's important to slowly loosen the leash and give them free reign so that way you're building their confidence throughout the semester. And then, you know, we've tinkered with assigning lead forecasters, things like that to help deliver those leadership roles that ultimately is going to help them. I mean, they're going out for job interviews and they can say, yes, I've led a forecast team. I've done all of this. You're giving them that invaluable experience that other undergraduates probably aren't going to have as much. Um, so then how long did the exercise take? Class time, one hour to 20 minutes deliverables, a seven day AFD. And then we've been doing zones. So just typing out high, low temperature, rain chances, weather impacts, wind speed, wind direction, sky cover. Will there be any injects? For this one, it was just phone calls. We didn't bother with DSS or anything. It was just real time phone calls. And then how are we delivering the information three days ahead, emailing the students, the general region to focus on. Day of, we will prepare a shift change briefing to give them at the beginning of the exercise to introduce them to the WFO, brief overview of the forecast and also expectations for them. How do we deliver the index? Google Meet breakout room. And then in what final format? Just Google Suite. It's so much easier for them to be able to collaborate in real time, especially virtually. I think that really helped pay off for them. And so then we go through our timeline. So we realized a week out, maybe the Northeast, somewhere in New England, there's a rain snow event. We covered winter weather a little bit. And so we go into specifically the exercise outline. And then three days out, we decided we wanted to focus on Pittsburgh. Who will be responsible for which part as moderators or actors? Apparently we said, nah, we'll decide that on Monday. The exercise was on Monday. So sometimes you just have to fly by the seat of your pants. I think this might've been right after Thanksgiving. So nobody was really around to help plan everything three days out. So we're flexible. We expect the students to be flexible. We live by what we preach. Uh, and then a complimentary guide. We said, nope, we're doing that on Monday too. And so then we have uh, who is assigned 
what. So checking in with moderators and actors, final questions, who's developing shift change. And so that ended up being on uh, our WCM and one of our forecasters. And then a couple of us were also the phone callers slash actors, which is a very, very fun role. So that's kind of how we guide go through at planning those exercises. And, you know, I mentioned that we cover zones, we cover AFDs, and you'd always see students ask a lot more questions about that than DSS, because again, we peppered in these exercises, but we'd never really asked them to write AFDs, construct zones. We never really covered that in the previous curriculums. So what we decided to do was flip the course around. So based on how the final exam had been conducted for the previous years, really focus the course topics on that. So we added courses on AFDs. Uh, we removed task formatting, focus on aviation impacts because, oh my God, it takes months to learn how to format tasks. And so trying to teach that in an hour and 20 minutes is just not setting the students up for success. That's really the goal here. So focusing more on aviation impacts. I just talked with class yesterday. So you're teaching them, okay, here's how you kind of forecast wind gusts. Do we think everything's going to make this down? Uh, here is how you try and evaluate wind shear. Here's how we look at cloud cover, how we evaluate ceilings. So again, those impacts rather than the specific coding, which is just echelons above what we really are looking for. And then also adding classes on social media graphics, AFD writing, again, tailoring the course to that final exam. And so here is what we are going through this semester. I can't believe we're already almost halfway through. So we just completed this one on aviation yesterday. We have our hydrofocal point presenting on hydrology tomorrow, and then we go into AFD. So you can see we kept the tropical classes because again, there is no tropical course at this university. And so we kind of use this to fill the gap as much as we can. And we push that in August and September when there's more likely to be activity. And then we focus, we had a virtual tour. We, Brian walked around with an iPad. And then we covered the NWS structure and questionnaires, which helps set the tone for the rest of the semester. We show them the questionnaire. We say, here's what you're going to have to answer if you want to work for the weather service. Keep this in mind as you go throughout the rest of the semester so that way they can see what experiences they want to gain to be able to answer those questions at the highest level. And then, you know, you can see everything else. We guide them through other topics that give them a very broad, mile wide, inch deep view of operations. So then what we also decided to do is try and provide some measurable sense of progress in the students. So we developed these course objectives initially back in 2019, I wanna to say, to evaluate the final exam. And we decided to try and tie that in for every other topic because this is something that we really want them to focus on uh, in terms of tangible areas of growth and experience. So the first one is collaboration. So how we tailor this is typically the first half of the semester, we'll mix the groups up, see, you know, use that as a way to evaluate skills, evaluate strengths, evaluate who works well together, make sure that you have very balanced teams. And so then once you are able to evaluate, try the permutations, you then keep them in the same groups for the second half of the semester. That helps build their camaraderie up. It helps them learn how to work together. So that way, when they get to the final exam, it's not like, oh my God, I've never worked with this person before. I have no idea what your communication style is. I have no idea what your strengths are. They're able to go through these exercises and learn that ahead of time. So collaboration is the first one. Timeliness is very important because <laughs> you can be right all day, but if you don't tell them what they need to know, it doesn't matter. So sometimes we'll have these injects where we'll call them and ask for this information to the emergency manager by a certain time. And if that email or briefing or whatever isn't sent, then we have that emergency manager call back and say, look, I have lives on the line. I mean, it, it, it can be realistic. So you have to make sure that you deliver these materials by certain deadlines. And we make sure that it's reasonable deadlines. We give quite a bit of a buffer. Um, so that was another big focus for this course. How has their timeliness improved? Making sure that they're able to efficiently go through everything while still maintaining that core quality. And also communication. That is essential for operating in a team environment, especially within a WFO. 
communicating with other offices, communicating with partners, how have those skills improved throughout the semester and making sure that in every mini exercise we give them, they are building those skills as well. And this, I did this in like an anti-motivational poster format because I, I'm so big on the scientific integrity because the GFS said so doesn't count. In their discussions and everything they do, how is their analysis? How are they really explaining why they're forecasting what they're forecasting? You can't just say, well, the GFS showed me green, so I think it's gonna rain. The GFS showed me blue, so I think it's gonna snow. Like, I, mm, mm. Dig a little deeper. So again, we try and provide that information and a couple of forecasting tips throughout the semester because, because the GFS said so doesn't count. If there's one thing you take away from this webinar. And then also our final objective is consistency, making sure that you are maintaining similar threats, timing impacts across all of their deliverables. So that counts for the ASD, the briefings, the phone calls. If they are discussing the potential for tornadoes in their briefings, but there is nothing referencing tornadoes in their ASD, that shows there's a consistency issue. So this ultimately boils down to communication and collaboration as well, because we see students sometimes breaking up. Okay, you take the ASD, I'll take the briefing, you answer the phone calls, go. And you know, it's kind of a divide and conquer method, which works, which is fine. But you want to make sure that they're discussing to each other, like, oh my God, did you see how this one model is really strengthening this into a cutoff low? And that could you know, have implications from there. So making sure that they're on the same page with their product. So there is that consistency presence. And then we have topic objectives. So those are the course objectives, big picture, big umbrella things. And then we also wanted to make sure that we provide smaller objectives for each course. So it's unique to each lecture. It's focusing on need to know, take home information. It's nothing, you know, it doesn't focus too much on the extraneous fun details. So from the numerical weather prediction fundamentals, NWP fundamentals lecture, this was what an objective slide looked like. So really just describing the difference between grid spacing and resolution. That is a very nitty gritty thing, I admit. I'm the one who gave this and that's just a pet peeve of mine. And I wanted to make sure that the students who go through this course do not make that error. And then we get a little more broad like they should be. So generically describing data assimilation, generically, what is statistical post-processing? How and when do we use it? What are its strengths, weaknesses? And then what are the different types of models? What are their pros and cons? This is really focusing on deterministic versus ensemble. And then you have within that, you have global, you have limited area, you have your CAM, things like that. So really those generic focuses. And then this was also a disclaimer I put at the beginning of the NWP slides, because again, it can be very dense and complicated. So the goal is just leaving more than when you showed up knowing more. You aren't expected to memorize every single facet of it. And they have the slides. So then also encouraging them to ask questions, answer their questions, make mistakes, be wrong, learn from it, it's okay. Um, so that is something that, you know, we really try and prioritize throughout this course as well, making sure that it is an active learning environment as much as possible, even when going through something as dense as NWP. So as Brian said, we started offering the advanced course this past spring. So what really is advanced? What does that mean? So the goal was to build on what we've done in the fall course, make it application-based, make it forward thinking, really focus on the evolution of the forecast and communication. You're not just writing that one AFD, creating that one set of zones and shipping it out. You are analyzing changes. You're becoming much more finessed with your forecasting. So here is what we did this past spring. It was a one credit hour course. So we met once a week and we were able to tailor it as a lab section. So even though it was one credit hour, we were able to meet for two hours, but we were not able to assign any homework. There was nothing to be done outside of the class. So the way we structured this was first with our introduction, focusing on the important of, importance of messaging, communicating to partners and communicating to the public. And then we had an initial presentation on DFS forecasting, because again, this is advanced forecasting for decision support. So we started out with the decision support side, and then we had a hazmat emergency response simulation, and that really helped us initially evaluate the briefing skills of the students. So that way we could get a common starting point. So that was the decision support side. So then we focused more on the advanced forecasting portion of the course title. So we then 
transitioned into numerical models in an operational environment. We focused on ensemble and probabilistic forecasting. So that way, again, we have that consistent groundwork to build upon for the rest of the semester. So then we go into briefing construction. We had emergency managers come in and talk, well, come in and talk to the students. We had broadcast meteorologists speak to that partnership. We had fire weather courses. We had a former IMET who is our boss, Todd Barron, come speak to the course. Uh, marine forecasting, <laughs> that was March 17th. We, we, did not, uh, we did not get that course and that was a very high impact, potentially high impact day for our WFO. So we needed all hands on deck and the students were able to deploy with their groups and help collect important data for that event as well. So we ended up unfortunately scrapping marine, but we did it this semester right now in the fall and it was a rousing success. So good job, Laurel. And then, you know, we go into GO 16, GO 17 applications, and then we filter into severe weather. We have, unfortunately, only one mock operations exercise, but we've been peppering in exercises throughout the rest of the semester, and then culminating in that final exam. And so, <laughs> wouldn't you know it, we got our own little inject this past year, a year and a half, God, with COVID, and that turned everything upside down because again one of our biggest impacts is collaboration it's communication it's working together it's recognizing teamwork and oh my god how do you do that virtually so that was really an opportunity for us to practice what we preach to really try and figure out how to make this work because this is or has been so built on interaction so how do we try and replicate that virtually so in, it, we came down to the same course objectives that we ask of the students. So collaboration, we worked with our whole team, the university, the office, everybody to try and transition this to a virtual environment. Everybody had such fantastic ideas to try and make this work. Google Meet breakout groups, trying to create consistent Google Drive folders. So that way they had a constant resource to come where we can deposit materials, the university, people can deposit materials, Ryan and Hunter. It was essential. And then timeliness. We made sure that we provided the materials well ahead of the time so the students can fully prepare. It's virtual. They aren't able to come into office hours and ask questions. They aren't able to just, you know, pop their head in and say, hey, I had a few questions about this. We'd had that happen before and we couldn't this time because nobody was allowed in the office. Not even Brian was allowed in the office for, gosh, about a year, I don't know, a while. It was a mess. And then communication. Sometimes our game plan changed. Sometimes what we thought would be our location wasn't. Sometimes people who we thought would be there ended up not being able to attend. And so you know, that's okay. But increasing that transparency from the WFO to the university, to the students and every single possible permutation within that. And then scientific integrity. It was so difficult trying to transition these exercises virtually. We wanted to make sure that they still were able to have those necessary lessons for the students. We still were able to maintain that scientific integrity on our end to make sure that what they're analyzing, what they're creating is something that is useful for them and not just busy work. And then lastly, consistency, making sure we establish a routine, expectations, how we provide materials, how we produce materials, how we collaborate on that. That is essential to what we did the past year and a half. And not as much now, we're able to be in person. So this is an example of what it looked like. We were in Google Meets, we didn't get photo permissions with cute little black circles in everybody's face, but you know, we met in Google Meet. <laughs> this is how we delivered the course, as did you know, all of the other university officials seeing this call. So you can see we have you know, a couple NWS employees on here and then students and you're just having a Google Meet. So this What's wrong with me one week ahead? This is a slide from our decision support course. Over here, this was from the first lecture in the advanced course. We had the students decide, you know, go through and list out who are potential partners that the National Weather Service works with and what type of weather would they be concerned with depending on the partners. So that was a way for them. Uh, I don't know if you can see, there's a symbol here for Jamboard, Google Jamboard. Again, the Google suite of products <laughs> saved our bacon. Um, so being able to use Jamboard, have them collaborate on everything, use sticky notes, post something here. What are your ideas? What are your thoughts? Group brainstorming was essential. So making sure that we had a way to facilitate that. And then leveraging the telework environments. You know what, if we got to do this, let's just go all in. So we were able to bring in guest lecturers we may not have been able to otherwise. 
we had local emergency managers come in and keep coming back to evaluate briefings, evaluate that because it didn't require them to give up that much of their time and drive in. It was just the two hours for the class. We had media partners come in and practice come in to the Google Meet and practice giving interviews for the students. They went over what type of communication works best for them. I mean, this is insight into forecasting that students don't usually get. They don't get until they've been in the job for a while. So hearing from these partners about their expectations and what they need and how to set them up for success really gives these students such an edge in the job market, which is incredibly competitive now. We had regional headquarters personnel come and present on ensembles and probabilities. Chad Gravel from Southern Region Headquarters presented on ensembles and probabilities with some material that he is trying to develop for the region. They are getting these cutting edge presentations that you know the weather service is still being trained on. And then also staff from other WFOs. Keith came in and you know helped moderate the severe weather and mesoanalysis ones. And I, he may have come back for the mock operations too. So I mean, you're able to bring these people back. You're able to establish these relationships virtually and introduce them and allow that networking that they may not have had otherwise. You know, students were very proactive sending thank you emails, follow up emails, what internships do you have emails? And that's really what this is about is again, setting the students up for success after university life. And so in advanced forecasting, again, it was for decision support. So part of that is communication. So we were able to simulate what we use, which is called NWS chat. We did that via Slack. So we had the actors join and you can change your name and you can you know, add different photos. And so you can ask questions as though you are partners posting in that collaborative chat room with partners. Um, it was a free trial, so nobody had to pay for anything for Slack. And then we also had fake Twitter accounts for them. We changed the password every time we logged in, we made it private so nobody could find it and accidentally think this was official information. Um, but you know, it was a way for them to post things and we had fake partner Twitter accounts where we could respond with questions, fake public Twitter accounts, we could respond with questions. So it, again, it's simulating life at a WFO as much as possible. We used breakout rooms in Google Meet again to simulate phone calls because we didn't wanna collect every student's personal cell. Maybe the students didn't have personal cell phones. Again, we didn't collect that information, so I can't speak to that. And then also we invited the guest lecturers back to see the students' progress. So we had the emergency managers evaluate briefings in their course or their topic. And then we had the emergency managers come back for the final exam and evaluate the briefings and deliver injects. So they were able to see that progress and speak to, oh my gosh, this student has so much more confidence. They really found themselves throughout this course. And hearing that feedback just makes, makes your day, makes your year. So how to get started at your WFO if, you know, I don't want to make this like a multi-level marketing scheme, but you know, if you, if you want to start this, the first thing you need to do is check with your MIC. If you are in the NWS, make sure that you have their support because that is absolutely essential. You need that if you're going to be doing this on work time, if you're going to get overtime comp time, potentially, um, that is where you need to start. Make sure that you have that support. Check with your MIC, check with your management team. And then you need to have an advocate at the university. Again, Christina had Ryan Wade and that, we love Ryan so much, we still work with him. And now we have Hunter Kramer, she's fantastic. So start building that partnership with guest lectures. That's at least what worked at our office is having those guest lecturers saying, hey, you know, we'd love to try and increase our relationship with your university. Is there any guest lecture we can provide? Is there any way we can come in maybe speaking to the student AMS group or student NWA group? That's another way you could get started. And then kind of pepper in the idea and just say, hey, you know, what if what if we taught a class about you know, forecasting or something like that? And so, you know, offering that, hey, you know, I'd be willing to teach. I'd be willing to help if you want to lead it, whatever works best for you. I think this is a, something that could benefit your program and something to help your students get hired more. And then ultimately that advocate is going to help gauge student interest in the course, because again, they have that relationship with the students. So then get your team on board. You cannot do this alone. You need everybody at your WFO. They all have such different strengths. They're able to collaborate to the topics you're able to teach because dear God, if you put me in charge of teaching fire weather or something like it, 
the symbolism there of the entire lecture being a crashing and burning would just be too rich. So, I mean, you, you need people to speak to their strengths. You need people to come in. So get the WFO support, especially for those, um, yeah, for the mock ops and the exams, you need as many people on board as possible. So make sure that there is interest at your WFO beyond you because it's a lot to take on. And then lastly, outline a topic list. Make sure that, again, you're playing to the strengths of who you have at your office, making sure that you are adequately preparing the students. I think giving a course on, you know, how to beat the moss is probably not worth an entire hour and a half. It could be something to pepper into a larger lecture, but, you know, making sure that your topic list is consistent with job expectations, because again, they aren't in the weather service yet. You're setting them up for the future weather service. So you kind of have to view the curriculum through that lens as well. And so some student feedback we've gotten, uh, you know, this is unofficial that's came through, or I don't know, Brian probably knows more. This may have come through course evaluations, but you know, some highlights that it, it gives them insight into a career in the weather service. It teaches them about forecasting. It teaches them about working with partners, which is something that I know I didn't have coming through school is delivering briefings, working with partners. And you'd have map briefings where you are expected to get very technical. When you're working with partners, you are not expected to get very technical. You need to learn how to translate that information. And that is a challenging, challenging skill to build. And then <laughs> this one's my favorite, how crazy a day of things can get in operations. So for those mock operations, like Brian said, we're trying to pick these high impact. You are gunning for something representative of maybe the top five craziest shifts you'll work in any given year. And so you'll go through things in real time. You'll think, oh my God, this would be great for a simulation. And so you write down certain aspects of what happened to you and you can incorporate that into a mock operations class. And so a lot of this is taken from real life experience and you'll see students say like, oh man, you're just, you're just hazing us. This is fake. And you're like, nope, here's the day I had last week. Here is everything that happened. Here's what we're expecting from you. And so that's why this first quote, like, oh, that's how crazy things can get. And it's true. And then making sure that you, the students can take the tools they learned in class and apply them in a real life situation. I, I love that too. And then just a truly unique experience that few undergrads get to have. That is what this course provides them. And so just a fun little sunshiny, where are they now? We have two students at Mount Holly, one who's there now, one who's about to go there. We have one at Huntsville, one at Springfield, Albuquerque, Goodland, Mobile, and probably more I've forgotten. I'm so sorry if, well, Brian and I, you know, couldn't quite remember, but this is at least what we could come up with at this point. And so if you have any questions, reach out to us. We also have Ryan and Hunter on the university side. They would love to help with any questions to send all four of us an email if there is anything you can think of. And then we also have, oh, five minutes <laughs> to answer questions if you want. We're fine to stay on later too, but that's all we have. Thank you so much, Keith, for having us and allowing us to speak as a part of this webinar series. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that was really great. Um, and I played a very small role in this course, but it was a lot of fun and I hope to participate again sometime. Um, you know, you addressed most of the questions that I had uh, throughout the course of the presentation. It was very thorough. Um, about the only thing I could think of, is there anything that you or Brian would like to incorporate in a future such class that you haven't gotten an opportunity to yet? Hmm. I, so I'll speak for myself. I think the new class in the spring has really helped us get to address most of the things that we want to address. I mean, I, there's, there's kind of an ongoing discussion about we're moving into this era of more probabilistic and um, ensemble-based forecasting. And I'm not sure how many of us knows exactly what that looks like. And, and so we, I know there's some folks who really want to think more statistically and probabilistically, but that's, that's a, I think that's, that we may be getting ahead of ourselves if I suggest that. So I think we're heading in the right direction without 
with, with the information we have. Yeah, that's a good one. Maybe establishing some like baseline statistics expectations, which I don't know, that might be interesting to try and make interesting, but yeah, it's, it's important. It's, uh, yeah, we have the probabilistic training we're going through. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. I think trying to hear from more partners is something, you know, having more time to build that, maybe bringing in Department of Transportation, maybe trying to bring in people, like we had Chad come from SRH, maybe trying to bring in someone from an RFC to speak, maybe bringing someone in from a CWSU, trying to, again, leverage what we have discovered here that, you know, virtual learning is a viable option. And so having people give these webinars and really having the ability to establish these connections we may not have otherwise. So I think that's a very large area with untapped potential for us. Yep, very good. It, it sounds like there's just so many hypothetical scenarios you can come up with, albeit some that are rooted in reality, as you said, some of the you know, once in a career type events. But you know, it's it's great experience for the students. I'm sure it's a lot of fun on your end, a lot of work on your end, but still a lot of fun. Um, so thank you again. I don't see any other questions in the chat. We're coming up on an hour here as well. So, um, but you did provide your emails. You also provide the emails for the folks on the UAH side. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to them. Um, I'm gonna wrap things up here. So if, if you missed last the last webinar, which was also this month, it was at the very beginning of the month. It seems like it was longer than that. But uh, that was our first in a series of mental health webinars. Um, the recording will be available soon, so check Twitter and Facebook for that. Um, and this recording will be available pretty soon as well. So thanks again to Katie and Brian. Thanks to everyone for coming out and uh, hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having us. Yeah. Sure thing. See you all later.